Okay, everyone, we're gonna we're gonna get started here, um, just so that we can remain on schedule. We've already been a couple minutes behind. Thank you for um, taking a, a shortened uh, morning break. So we are now moving into um, a couple of other panels. Uh, the the first panel is going to be on back pain, and then immediately following that, we'll have one on soft tissue tumors. Uh, moderating this panel, we have Dr. Gedroik, who is one of the first people to have used MR-guided focused ultrasound um, in this indication. So without further ado, thank you, Dr. Gedroik, and the rest of our panelists. Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you're wide awake. Um, this panel is going to be a relief for you from the previous panels. We're not going to talk about any immunotherapy. We're not going to talk about T cells. There'll be no gene components to this talk. We're going to keep it really simple. In other words, now for something completely different, okay? Now, of course, many of you may say the fact you're not talking about all those things means that you're going to be a dismal failure. Well, you know, I'll leave that to your judgment um, as we go along. But we are going to if you like, go back to some basics of focused ultrasound. So, we're going to talk about back, back pain. And as you know, back pain is a perennial in clinical medicine. I would strongly bet that at least 40% of the people in this room have experienced back pain, either for short periods or many of you for much longer periods. And although it's not killing you, it is extremely unpleasant and it is a massive clinical problem. So anything we can do to improve back pain is of great value. The other difficulty in back pain is it is what can be described as a dirty area. That's to say it is multifactorial. All sorts of problems, all sorts of different things impinge, whether they're actually physical, osteogenic, muscular, or psychogenic, they all swirl around together, causing problems for the people who experience this. And it's often hard to separate these things out. Now, the predominance of what we're going to talk about today is going to be aimed at the facet joint. And that seems to be one of the few targets we can reach with focused ultrasound. Between 20 to 30% of back pain is said to be due to facet joint pain. And the way this works is that the neural structures around the facet joints fire off and mediate back pain somehow. And we don't really understand it. So what we're going to do, the way people have approached facet joints is to mimic the types of interventional procedures that are out there. And I'm sure you know that there are all sorts of um, procedures that are in place. We inject steroids, we inject local anesthetics, we ablate the facet joints, all this sort of stuff. And the principle here is we destroy or alter the neural fibers mediating the pain using focused ultrasound generated local heat. The other thing that is worthwhile remembering is that peripheral nerves are destroyed at a lower temperature than, than soft tissue structures. So one of the things for people who are doing focused ultrasound around the body is beware of neural damage because it is very easy to do. And I can absolutely testify from my own experience that it is very easy to do if you get it wrong. Um, the target that we go for in facet joint pain is probably one of the more controversial aspects here. Um, but it is an accessible area for focused ultrasound, whereas the other causes of back pain, such as disc compressions, vertebral body, are really tough to access with conventional focused ultrasound. So what I'm going to do for you is briefly discuss the areas of work that each of these panel members have been involved in, and then ask them to expand on their work. So I'm going to praise it for you in case you fall asleep during later on um, and in introduce the work. 
a little while ago, I started this area of work and we treated facet joint pains. And this is the paper we developed. And we used MR guidance to target the facet joints themselves. So we would target the posterior aspects of the facet joints to try and destroy the neural structures running along there to improve the mediation of that pain. And we had pretty good success, about a 60% improval at six months, which is pretty good in the mixed field of back pain. So let's just briefly go along the row here. Dr. Dux and his team, Regensburg and um, in Frankfurt, and that group has taken up much of the original work that my group did and applied and developed it and improved upon it. They've treated multiple patients, and I think Dr. Dux here is going to present a cohort of 65 patients, and he has an improvement of around 75% at 12 months, which is pretty impressive in back pain, since most, as you know, treatment of back pain is a thankless task. But the main question remains, should we treat the facet joint itself or should we treat the medial neural branch that lies a little bit further inferiorly and laterally? And um, that is a question we're going to bat around, I think, for the next half hour or so between us and come to no particular conclusion other than some people do it this way, some do it in another way. But the procedure is safe with a minimal risk of neural damage. And here's a visual um, description of where we're going to go. You can see the backs of the, fac of the facet joints and where we, we can do some targeting. And you can also see the medial branch there. Facet joint targeting is more selective. It may have a slightly increased incidence of treatment failure. The medial branch, however, is, I, I thought, I've always, in my own experience, found it more difficult to get at. But our experts are going to tell us a bit more about that. Then, once we get through that, the next evolution is actually going to be, do you actually need the MR guidance to deliver focused ultrasound to facet joint safely, accurately, and successfully? The MR components make it a more expensive procedure, it's longer, and interrupts other work schedules. Can this be done using simple fluoroscopic techniques? And Eric Hananel and his team have taken that approach and are looking to see whether it can be a simple in-out procedure using fluoroscopic without any MR guidance. And it's going to be really interesting to see a bit more from their group about how that works. And th this is a description of their pilot study, but I think we'll let Eric talk a bit more about how that's developed and where he sees it going as we go along. But for those of you who are interested, here are some of his early figures. Then we're going to get a bit more complex. We're going to leave the um, simpletons like myself, who like a bit of destruction, and we're going to go on to neuromodulation. And Viola Rica is going to tell us how they're trying to evolve that particular process to alter the pain perception of back pain in these patients. I'm not sure what that is, we'll get over that. Uh, oh yes, 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 ah yes, we'll go back. Yes, this is some slides that I'm going to show you later on. Okay, so that is the introduction. And let's start off with Daniel. Daniel, tell us about the work you've been um, exploring. Uh, kind introduction. Um, my name is Daniel Dux. I'm a resident in the University of Hanover, and um, I think um, it's it's uh, really important to talk about uh, the targets which you can deliver for MR uh, or with HIFU in general. Because I think HIFU, if it's fluoroscopic guided or MR guided, uh, is the only ablation technique which allows to target the facet joints directly. Um, because historically, if you look at the uh, literature for let's say AFA. And they always uh, target the nerve because there's not much uh, anatomical variation to it. You place a needle parallel to it and then you can ablate it and it's pretty effective. You get like six to 12 month pain improvement, sometimes even more. 
and uh, it's the more standardized way to do it. The problem is, uh, if you talk about ablation for facet joints, is that uh, it's only a temporary pain relief. In this time, the patients are supposed to do um, to, to improve their strength for the back muscles, and they are supposed to do physiotherapy. And um, the problem is with targeting the nerve is that this nerve also contains the innervation of these muscles uh, for the back, which you are supposed to train. So there, I, I, I'm not uh, familiar with any studies actually looking if physiotherapy is anywhere impaired by targeting the nerve directly. So our approach was to target the facet joint, um, which is easier to do with HIFU because you can just come from different angles. If you do this needle-based, you have to replace the needle multiple times in order to get the whole facet joint, which is um, pretty tough. And it is still uh, difficult to do this um, because uh, you need to make sure that you ablate the whole facet joint because the innovation is spread all along um, the, uh, the, the joint. And if you miss only a little bit, you are at risk to, to um, miss the, um, uh, to, to get pain improvement. So uh, I think uh, that's, uh, w w we thought that uh, if you target the facet joint, uh, it would be a nice advantage. And uh, so we tried to do this. And um, um, in our study, we included patients without, without the diagnostic blocks. Most of the patients, they didn't come uh, with referral. They came by themselves. So um, they wanted to get this treatment. And there are also some advantages to, um, to, uh, to include patients without a diagnostic block before this. Um, but you cannot distinguish the patients um, if they are, um, if they will have improvement from the treatment if you don't do a, a diagnostic block, but the absolute number of patients who will have improvement is actually higher, and if you do RFA, it's also more cost-effective. That's, that's why we went straight for ablation. And in our study, we showed that um, from 70 treatments, uh, 54 percent of the patients actually got significant pain, uh, clinically significant pain improvement, and they had the pain improvement about uh, 60 percent. And at one year, there were only 12 questionnaires left, unfortunately. Um, but uh, the patients who had improvement at one year, they actually got the pain improvement of 70 percent. So it seemed to be the case that patients who had more improvement, they also had a more longer-lasting improvement. Um, so, yeah. Daniel, Daniel, tell me, um, do you treat just one level or do you treat multiple levels each time? So um, we treat, uh, like typically we treat it L3 to S1. Um, sometimes, depending on the MRI, uh, we also treat it higher up. Um, I think the highest level was L1. Um, so it depended on the, the MRI. And do you treat on both sides? Yes. Yeah. When you, before you get your patient into doing a, an ablation. Will you, I presume you do MRs beforehand to make sure they have no compressive elements, etc. is that right? Yes, that's right. So um, we had a um, recent MRI um, showing the, that the patients had um, um, a facet joint uh, um, uh, arthrosis. Um, we didn't exclude patients if they had other, um, um, uh, like for example, this caniation. Um, we graded the patients uh, into different categories, like patients who only had facet joint arthrosis, who also had, because often, in most cases, patients with facet joint arthrosis, they also have um, this caniation or spondylolisthesis. So we didn't exclude them per se, but they needed to have um, um, a clinic which might be the primary case uh, cause for the pain for facet joints. Yeah. So, so they have to have a positive response to a, a facet intervention, first of all, is that right? S not, not all of the patients. No? Um, so we also, so um, the, the patients, they could have a, a positive response, um, but some of the patients, they, we offered them to do infiltration beforehand to like um, diagnose it with uh, a diagnostic block. But most of the patients, they, are, they don't want to get uh, uh, infiltration. So they, um, they said we want to have the ablation 
because it's like non-invasive and the risk for any like um, for any side effects is so low they just went for the ablation. So, so I think we're already starting to see some of the difficulties in back pain. Yeah. That, um, that it, I think it is, as I said, you know, it's such a multi, multiply dirty field with all sorts of things. It's not an individual diagnosis we're often dealing with, is it? So there's a problem. Thank you for that. Um, let, let's move on and see how this whole procedure can be streamlined without MRI. And Eric's going back to fluoroscopy. Um, which most of us who are radiologists here felt that was a bit, it's a bit old fashioned and you know, dull and all that sort of stuff. We don't, and on top of that, we don't like getting our hands in the way and getting radiation. A Eric, tell, tell us about your philosophy and how you target the correct areas. Thank you for the introduction. We, um, based you know, on the years of both uh, me and Ron, my uh, co-founder in the company. Uh, we've been years in the field of uh, medical device, focus ultrasound, and we kind of um, seen where all the obstacle for adoption came from. And basically, uh, if the, we change the price structure, if there's no reimbursement, if there's a turf war in the hospital, changing the target, changing the modality, all those things ended up creating uh, obstacles on adoption. So we, we said we'll try to pick an application and, and implement it in such a way as we're least disruptive as possible while still providing a disruptive value. So we're doing the same target as the standard of care RF ablation, meaning we're targeting the medial nerve branch. We're using the same imaging modality, fluoroscopy, that is being used today. Same patient flow, same patient owner. Uh, we're, we're targeting in the same modality. Usually the pain clinician do L3 to L5 bilateral. We just follow the footsteps of what they're doing. The only thing we're doing different is we, we switched from, from a needle to an ultrasound. Hence, that's the value we're trying to provide. And HIFU, for, for uh, this specific indication, besides providing the non-invasive approach, it, it's also, we, we learned over time, it's also less painful for the patient. We can create uh, lesions which are slightly bigger compared to the current uh, RF ablation needle lesion. And those lesions, because they're slightly bigger, mean there's a higher success rate and there's higher durability, at least in theory. We still need to prove it. Uh, another thing we've seen since we use the bone to absorb the acoustic energy, and I'll go into this in a second, the lesion is actually created from the bone tissue interface outwards, which means the, the risk of having a floating lesion that you sometimes get with a needle, where the lesion is above the nerve and doesn't go all the way into the nerve location. We don't have it. It starts actually where the nerve is located, so targeting is slightly easier. And in terms of... Uh, why we drop uh, the MRI, uh, you know, the, the straightforward operational uh, issues with the MRI, you know, it's, it's uh, expensive, it makes everything slower, uh, and most of the pain clinician just don't have access to MRI. Doesn't mean it's not a great procedure, it's a great procedure, and, you know, there's always a sub-segment that uh, relies on this, but we said if we can replace the MRI with something else, we have a lot of incentive to do this. And basically the rationale was if we're hitting the bone tissue interface and the bone absorption is both high and predictable, we can kind of treat it the same rationale, use the same rationale as radiosurgery. I mean, you simulate it and, and you predict it, but unlike direct soft tissue ablation, which has acoustic vari variability, in our case, the prediction is pretty much spot on. 
and hence we said goodbye to the MRI. Uh, we still use it to, to see the result afterwards and you know, uh, identify patient, but we've seen that with fluoroscopy you get uh, easier operational limitation and good clinical result. Okay, well, let's, let's make sure we get everyone to talk at this panel. So perhaps we could go to Lynn Cohan next from the University of Virginia, who's online, and I think she's going to talk about her work in SI joints, uh, which we all want to hear about. Great, thank you so much. Um, and, and as others have said, you know, back pain is complicated um, and it can be from multiple sources, but sacroiliac joint pain is very common as well. And so this is another really good target to use focused ultrasound. Um, and so the, uh, the targets um, that we were looking at is the innervation of the SI joint, which comes from the lateral branches as well as the L5 the sacral lateral branches, as well as the L5 dorsal ramus. So this is the areas that we're trying to target. Um, as Eric alluded to, um, you know, it's nice with focus ultrasound because it makes this bigger lesion. And one of the complications for um, when treating the SI joint is that uh, these nerve supply is very variable from person to person and even within the same person. So having a technique to make those um, bigger lesions is definitely beneficial. In addition, because the innovation is complex and because it's in multiple areas, you have to currently use a lot of needles and it's really one of the more painful procedures um, that pain physicians can do. And so having a more pain, you know, decreasing having a technique to decrease the pain while performing this procedure is beneficial. And so that's kind of what led us to kind of thinking about targeting um, this area. And so we started by doing some of um, cadaver studies by um, you know, putting the electrodes um, at the, the targets um, along the sacral lateral branches, as well as putting electrodes within the sacral foramen themselves, because of course we want to avoid um, any heating up of the, the sacral nerve roots. Um, and what we found was that we're able to target the sacral um, lateral branches effectively without heating up the foramen. Um, so this was an important finding. And from here, um, we are going to hopefully um, start um, the process on patients. Fantastic. Um, does a posterior approach, do you think, let you get to less of the joint than you would otherwise? Do you think that's, is that a disadvantage? So you can never, we never um, approach it from the anterior approach. Um, and, you know, and when we're doing, you know, using fluoroscopy and using radio frequency, we've only ever been able to approach it posteriorly. And so we can't um, approach it anteriorly with any current technique. And so when patients still do well, you know, there's emerging um, research coming out that's showing, you know, really good longevity with regular RF. And so I suspect the same or hopefully even better with um, focus ultrasound technique. Yeah, so basically, we're, as throughout all of our work here, we're looking at for inspiration from things that have been done percutaneously and moving them into an interventional pr process. Would that be fair? Definitely. And like I said, I mean, it's really like in our practice at the University of Virginia, we pretty much never use sedation, but the one... This is one of the few procedures where currently some people need sedation because it's just so many needles and the burns are painful. And so having, you know, and people are scared. And some people don't want to get relief because they're just so scared of the actual procedure. And so I think there's going to be a huge advantage to take it away from having to use the percutaneous needles um, and have a really totally non-invasive technique. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Now we're going to turn to our last panelist. Dr. Viola Rica, and she's going to tell us about her neuromodulation um, approach to back pain. First, I want to start, can you hear me, uh, with Eric's um, discussing that why would you make something um, more difficult if you can do it easier? So his approach doing it x-ray or his procedure x-ray guided. Um, so we, so, so I'm an MR physicist, so I needed to find an application that is more complicated so I can justify it using the MR. So I'm uh, in kind of one of our projects, we uh, look at the cervical spine and try to develop an MR guided system for, uh, this is for ablation. And uh, so uh, similar to 
the lower spine, we are also targeting the nerves or the, um, the joints directly. And for me, I mean, this is device design. Uh, it's really interesting to hear uh, where we should target, but right now we are just, I mean, I just want to um, be able to target precisely in the neck, um, avoiding all the more critical structures here with vessels and, and uh, nerves uh, through into the brain and uh, facial nerves. So this one we demonstrate in a, uh, looking in a GOAT model, and hopefully we'll, I mean, the goal is to get FDA, uh, IDE approval for a first-in-human trial. So now I'm coming to the neuromodulation. So, um, so here we're looking at um, targeting the dorsal root ganglion, which uh, essentially all the nerves from the peripheral nervous system go through the dorsal root ganglion uh, and then go into the central nervous system. So by uh, targeting the dorsal root ganglion with something that isn't a full ablation, but uh, we're using uh, focused ultrasound parameters that have some mechanical component, but we are also having a little bit of a thermal effect, so maybe it's actually kind of the smaller uh, pain uh, fibers that are more th uh, sensitive to the temperature that get affected. Uh, but with this treatment, we try to see if we can get uh, a pain relief. So we developed a neuritis pick model where we are creating neuropathic pain and then uh, targeting with it with, and treating it with focused ultrasound and then uh, look long term, do we see a pain decrease? And we do that with a quantitative sensory testing. Uh, and this is essentially, this is similar to this uh, FACES pain scale that was um, that is used in, in humans that cannot uh, self-report or in children, and then we modified that to pigs. <laughs> and while well, this is a, a, a funny image here, it is actually, it is very difficult to do pain research in animals, in large animals, and just trying to, to I mean, as an engineer, for me, it's easy to build a device that can do something, but this was really a challenge to how do we measure in, in pigs, is there a pain decrease over time? And then with our method, so, so there, uh, uh, they, they go through similar tests that are done in humans, uh, heat and pain threshold, pin prick, and some um, mechanical stimuli and then see if, if there are responses in the uh, different dermatomes. And we could see in our procedure that if we created the, the nerve injury and then did focused ultrasound, we were able to see a pain decrease for uh, like three to four weeks before it went up, um, uh, increased again. Fantastic. So Viola, you've got quite a bit of experience now in torturing animals. Um, yes. What happens? when you have, let's say, a standard British pig who is very stoic and, and doesn't want to show their emotion on their face. How do you cope with that? That is actually a very difficult thing. We, we do, I mean, for us, we're still figuring out there are definitely more stoic pigs. So we always, I mean, we treat uh, unilateral, we treat one side of the pig, so we have the other side as a control. And there are some pigs that, I mean, with the smallest poke, they have something that, I mean, in our uh, pain response uh, is relatively high, but it is the same on the, um, on the side that we didn't treat. So we try to actually judge how, how um, stoic or unstoic. So uh, we didn't have British pigs, though, no, yet. But. Quite. And, um, what about if you have your standard sort of hysterical pig? Are, are they excluded from your study? We, yeah, I think we'll, we need to do that. Yep. Uh, we do have, I mean, uh, we're still in the process of going through all the histology samples because sometimes it feels like we have a stoic pig, there is nothing, we, we don't see a difference in the treated side versus the untreated side, so now we're going back into histology to actually take a look how, how much of a neuritis did develop, so it's, it's a kind of the, the whole, it's, these are long-term experiments, just with until you have all the results. And how, how do goats fare in this bit? Because you, you've said you're, you're doing um, cervical spines in goats. Are they easier, do they have better facial expressions than pigs? 
That is, I mean, it's also a, a valid question. We did, this is not the study we're doing here, so the, the neck pain, we are only doing, um, uh, these are also survival experiments, but we, we just want to look for safety, so if the uh, goat walks around and doesn't have any issues. We're not doing the, the full quantitative right. sensory testing. Right. However, we did try this for a different experiment, and we got this, the, these goats from uh, a vendor, and they were semi-feral, and they get, did not, we weren't able to train them at all. So you need to, if you do that, you need to actually start with younger animals that uh, that are used to humans. Whereas the pigs, the pigs are actually good for that because they are very food motivated. So you can teach them a lot of things. Fantastic. So I think we're learning a lot about um, that particular aspect. Um, I want to ask our panelists, tell me about your, wh whether you have really decided whether we should be treating the facet joint itself or the medial bundle. Eric, um, what should yeah. we do? Since, uh, Which is best? <laughs> we picked the nerve itself for a couple of reasons, but I'll be honest, the biggest one is the CPT codes, uh, the reimbursement. There is a reimbursement if you do neuralizers for the medial nerve branch, at least in some of the bigger markets we're looking into, and there is less reimbursement there's no reimbursement if you treat the joint. That is at least from what uh, we've seen. So th that's, I'm, I'm kind of honest, that was like our main reason. But having said this, uh, the nerve itself is located at the junction of the transverse and, and, and the base of the pedicle of the joint. Uh, this is considered non-weight wearing bone. So even if there is some collateral damage to the bone there, uh, which always happen with HIFU. Uh, this area is not an area of concern, so that's one reason we picked it. The other one, when we first um, discussed uh, a pilot study uh, with the FDA, they voiced a concern about the joint stability if you treat the joint itself. Uh, I personally don't think it's an issue, but it just makes things simpler also with uh, regulatory approval to go for the nerve. Okay. So a, bit of, a, few, a, few, a few reasons. Yes, sorry. From a clinical standpoint, too, I mean, a little different because it's you know, using different technology, but interarticular injections into the facet joint themselves have not shown the same um, you know, longevity as treating the medial branch nerve you know, the radio frequency ablation of the, of the medial branch nerve. So I know, right, it's injection versus RF, but treating the interarticular joint itself is kind of falling out of favor in, you know, recent international guidelines. I'm, tr I'm talking about facet mediated pain. Okay, and what, what about you, Daniel? Where, where do you stand on this thorny topic? So, <clears throat> I think, um, so we started uh, to select the patients individually. Um, based on a few criteria, because I think there are advantages to do both um, and disadvantages. And um, so there are also different patients. There are patients who are very active in sports, who are playing tennis or golf. So they have uh, typically a very strong mus musculature. And if you target the ner nerve there, you, you really mess with the biomechanics of the of the spine, or you can mess with it, because mm -hmm. then you have a strong musculature superior and inferior and no mus not so much musculature in between. So I think you can cause translational forces which, which uh, might be worsening the, the pain. But there are also patients who, um, who are not very active and their musculature, they tend to get uh, fatty infiltration over time. And um, then I think it's not that much of an issue and it's much easier to target the the nerve compared to the, uh, like it's, it's, you know where you go for, there's no variation and then you can make sure that you hit all the nerves. Um, so I think it depends on, and also if you do it MR guidance, if, uh, if there is a fatty infiltration, um, thermometry is not working reliable and then you also can just go for the nerve, I, I think, uh, and you're yeah. faster. 
Yeah, I think that's an excellent perspective. Thank you for that. Uh, that's a very important way to distinguish some of the patients. I think that, uh, that clears up a lot of stuff in my mind, certainly, uh, which is always clouded at the best of times. Um, okay. Um, can I ask the team... We're coming to you in a minute. <laughs> Um, can I ask the team, what other areas of low back pain problems do you think we should be addressing? Are there any other ones that we should be trying to do with focused ultrasound? Yeah. Mm, so, um, I, so I think, uh, I mean, um, most uh, facet joint arthrosis in, is in the lower back, but there is also facet joint arthrosis in the, in the, in the, um, in the, um, um, cervical uh, spine, and I think uh, so far there are not many people doing ablation in the cervical spine because you're much more afraid to hit uh, the nerve and really cause uh, a, a, a nerve palsy there. And I think with HIFU, it's um, because it's, you, you, can, you can target very reliable, and uh, I think to go for higher levels would be... Um, um, uh, um, a, a good advantage. I, I think there is a need for these patients who have cervical spine yeah. uh, facet joint arthrosis. Right. And so. Okay. Um, so that's a, a, a. Any other strong feelings from the rest of the panel about? I know, I know Viola's trying to attack goats in the cervical spine. Um, Eric, are you attacking any goats at the moment? So, uh, Dr. Kohan from uh, UVA is uh, working on uh, sacroiliitis. I think that's probably the next frontier in low back pain, or what we call low, low back pain. And um, you may want to say something about this. Uh. Yeah, I agree. Um, no, it's definitely another common cause of low back pain. Um, so people who have you know, spondylosis can also have um, you know, um, degeneration of SI joints. People who've had fusions, so where you really you know, can no longer target the lumbar uh, area, they can have different forces on the SI joint. So that's a really common area um, of pain for the SI joint, uh, which makes it a good target um, for focus ultrasound as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Now, um, I, perhaps I could open it up for questions from the floor. We had a, an eager question over there. Um, I'm curious if any of the panelists see any uh, brain target indications for low back pain. I, I'm curious how low back pain would differ from a chronic pain indication, for example, for brain targeting, for pain amelioration. Anybody want? Um, I mean, uh, I'm not uh, an expertise in this field, but. So we heard that there is, uh, um, uh, in another session, that there is a target in the brain for chronic pain. I am not sure if you can do this. I, I'm not sure if you can do this for back pain. May, maybe uh, it's an interesting thought, uh, but I'm, maybe there's someone else who can, has, in, um, has more expertise in brain targeting for chronic pain. I'm working with an um, interventional neuroradiologist who's interested in, in finding out, I mean, wh which targets would you uh, use for that? So I think the, I mean, I was very excited to hear uh, uh, kind of in the more neuromodulation sessions in the, uh, that we, we heard about that, that maybe that's a way to explore which targets may be something that respond to back pain. Yeah, I mean, th I think what we're saying is there could be ra some rather interesting potential for cingulate gyrus or s lateral thalamic neuromodulation in that a area. Um, although very few people have gone for back pain as a neuropathic, long-standing problem to co go for an ablation, but yeah, it's an interesting um, area that co could be developed. Do we have any other questions for this? August panel. I have a question. Oh, yes, please. Um, okay, so uh, um, my wife suffered a uh, epidural that went wrong and had severe spinal headaches for a few days. Uh, so I'm wondering if the panel could speculate, maybe wildly, on whether you could uh, get the same effect as an epidural but non invasively using ultrasound. Okay, well, I would hope we wouldn't necessarily give her the headache. 
and as we know, the headache is usually due to CSF leak. Um, perhaps, Lynn, you could um, start to approach that, since um, epidurals are going to be more in your neck of the woods. Uh, I mean, I think that's obviously an interesting idea, um, but, you know, epidurals are used to decrease, so it's usually combined, you know, with steroid um, to decrease inflammation. Um, you know, I, I think looking at the work of the, the DRG and the neuromodulation, that might be where there's some carryover because obviously you wouldn't want to make a therm, you know, a, let's say a thermal lesion there because that could potentially increase pain. And I certainly think it's an area to look in the future, but I'd be interested, you know, I, I think more applying the, the DRG and targeting the DRG because, um, you know, where is the nerve root being compressed? Um, also, is it being compressed centrally versus in the foramen or peripherally? because um, that might factor in what, what you can do or not do with focused ultrasound. I'm not sure if anyone else has any other thoughts. No, I, I, I think it would be very difficult to duplicate an epidural, the widespread um, sort of uh, changes that a new, an epidural does with MR. It will probably take you about five or six hours minimum, and you'd be there in the MR scan or whatever forever. And um, I think perhaps we might keep off that one, if that's all right. <laughs> um, Anyone else with any other questions for the panel? Otherwise, we'll finish early and keep everything on time. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>